Alhamdulillah, Hamdan Shakirin, wa salamu ala isil mursaleen, abina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all of you and a very uh, great thanks for the very kind invitation to speak and address you all the way there in, in Toronto and Canada. May Allah put barakah in our time together. May Allah make this a useful uh, exercise for us, inshallah, to learn things that will benefit us and draw us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is always uh, interesting for myself. Of course, I've spent a lot of years uh, studying the Crusades, and I've also authored a book on this subject. And I continue to write on this topic. Uh, but particularly in the life of somebody as uh, magnanimous, really, as important as the character of Salah al al-Ayyubi, uh, every human history, of course, has a backstory, has a context. It is very important for us to understand the context of events before we even understand and appreciate the great role and significance of somebody like Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi and also those who came preceded him, like Nuruddin Zengi, for example. Um, I want us to remember that the one of the, the biggest, I think, uh, points uh, of discussion needs to really begin with Al-Andalus, with, with Islamic Spain, that is, in fact, where the genesis of the idea of the crusade, in fact, begins uh, during the, the dwindling power of the Muslims of Al-Andalus, uh, when the Muslims had broken up into the Muluk al-Tawaif, into the, into the small autonomous party kingdoms uh, in the major uh, states of Al-Andalus now became small independent kingdoms. Uh, and the Christians of the north of Navarre and Leon and Castile and Aragon were taking advantage of that weakness. And so uh, in doing that, therefore, uh, the Muslims and the Muslim state of Andalus becomes weak. They were seeking assistance from the Muslims, Yusuf ibn Tashufin of the Maghrib, but that couldn't last all, all very long because even they divided amongst themselves, the Murabitun, the Mawahidun, uh, after the death of Ibn Abi Amr al-Mansur, uh, really it was, it was coming down to the, the end, really, of the, of the great legacy of, of that empire, even though they remained for many hundreds of years in Granada, and you had the, the great uh, narrative of, of the Moriscos and the Moriscas. Uh, really, uh, in, the, uh, in the beginning of the uh, 11th century, you might say that that's where the, the seeds of, of the vision and discord really began to manifest themselves you know, in, in that empire. Uh, the Christians uh, taking advantage of this. So you had, for example, uh, Pope Gregory the seventh, one preceding Urban II, who in fact launches a crusade in 1095, uh, who uh, authorizes a, uh, a a papal bull, which was an, uh, a kind of a promise of of, of penance, of, of forgiveness for those who participated and and recovered the state of uh, of Zaragoza, you know, from the Muslims. If they did that, they would have full forgiveness and remission of sins. And that's exactly what happened when when the Pope Urban II. Uh, authorized and launched the crusade against the Muslims of Beit al-Maqdis of Jerusalem. So therefore, the genesis is in Al-Andalus in Spain. Second to that, of course, even in 1089, Urban II himself uh, authorizes another uh, crusade. In fact, this is for the, the Spaniards, for those who went and defended the church of, uh, of Tarragona, for example. Uh, and again, they would have full forgiveness and, and remission and pardon of sins. And this was really the key novel feature of the crusade because crusade was a very religious experience. I mean, the first crusaders were called uh, Milite, uh, Milite Peregrini Christi. They were pilgrim knights of Christ. Uh, they were marked with the cross. They had to go, and we know this from church charters, they had to go, you know, giving their, their possessions away or keeping them, you know, with the church, making a promise uh, to die for Christ, for example, and if they did that, even if they died en route, uh, they would have uh, full remission of sins, and that was that was really the, the big selling point for the crusade. And when Urban II, therefore, in Claremont, uh, calls for the crusade against the Muslims of Beit al Maqdis, again there is a backstory. So one, of course, is to do with Al Andalus, as Andalus as really the uh, remember, Spain, of course, is the, is the largest country in all of Europe. Uh, Muslims were there for hundreds of years. We had the, the Khilafa was there, the, the Khalif of the Rahman II, the, sorry, the third was there uh, as the Khalif of Al-Andalus, really. Um, and so there's much to be said there. The other thing, of course, now was the fact that, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the early 11th century, there was, I think in the 10, 11, maybe, um, uh, a, an account of the Fatimid Khalif al-Hakam bi Allah destroying a part of the Holy Sepulchre, 
which for Christians, you know, is the most sacred destination on earth. It's where they believe uh, Jesus died and was buried. And of course, we don't believe that. Uh, you know, and Allah says, Allah raised, of course, him up, alayhi salam. But that's what they believe. And they believe that's the most sacred ground on earth to be treasured. And of course, it is an, until today. Uh, and so in, in that destruction of that church, the, the, the information was going back from Western pilgrims who were traveling for pilgrimage and then going back and reporting, you know, to, uh, to the Western uh, audiences, uh, the, the papacy, the clergy, that this is what the Muslims have just done in Jerusalem. And so this is one of the, the stories that was carried, you know, as propaganda in the first crusade. And I'm saying propaganda because... Uh, there was a restoration of the Holy Sepulchre Church uh, in the decades uh, <coughs> following the uh, what the Fatimid um, Khalif al hakam al Amrullah uh, in fact did in that, in that place. Uh, second to that, of course, there was uh, a letter that was sent from the uh, Byzantine Emperor Alexis Comnenus to Urban II preceding the events of the crusade. This was uh, an appeal for assistance because the Muslims of, of Anatolia uh, were, were encroaching upon the Byzantine Empire. You had, of course, the great battle of Manzika, 1074, the victory of Alp Arsalan, and they were scared and frightened. So they, therefore, he assist, uh, asked for assistance from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the Catholic Pope, Urban II, against the Muslims. This was another thing. Number three was a propaganda against Islam. These people had no knowledge of Islam because Muslims didn't live, of course, with them. Unlike Muslims who we lived, of course, with Christians for hundreds of years since that time and knew about Christianity and knew about the people of Ahlul Kitab, but there were not Muslims living, of course, with them. And so it gave them, you know, really free reign to invent uh, a lot of horrific stories about the Muslims. Urban II, in fact, in, in, in some of the accounts of his speech, of surviving account of his speech, uh, you know, said things like they, they, they worship a man called Muhammad, they, uh, they uh, prostrate to the idols, they, they sacrifice babies at the altar, I mean, horrific, horrific things. And this, of course, for the Christians, uh, had a big impression on their hearts and minds, and they believed that they were traveling, therefore, to, to fight and defeat these infidel barbarians who they saw as Muslims. Uh, you know, against uh, you know, in in light of you know, in uh, for the honor of Christianity, for the honor of Christ, um, it's those same points of propaganda, in fact, that were carried just last year uh, in the horrific uh, terror attack in in Christchurch, New Zealand, by Brendan Tarrant, uh, because in fact, so one of my 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 most recent book was called uh, On Being Human, which was published in fact in Christchurch, which was launched in New Zealand. Uh, I have a section on the. Uh, terror attack in Christchurch, and and so uh, in 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 his manifesto, uh, Brendan Tarrant's manifesto, he's referencing Urban II's speech at Clermont, and one of his lines is, in fact, is ask yourselves what would Urban II do, meaning against the Muslims today. So it just shows, therefore, how the that the the propaganda, how how deeply entrenched it was in the Christian mindset until even until in our contemporary time. Uh, you know, 2019, at uh, this horrific act committed in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, this was one of the, the rallying cries of that sadistic individual, uh, Brenton Tarrant. Um, anyway, the, the, the crusade then was launched, um, and uh, in, in, when it was launched, uh, you know, many people responded to Urban II's appeal. There was uh, a great kind of, uh, you know, a lot of enthusiasm, uh, because, of course, he's promising forgiveness of sins of people who were already uh, soaked in sin. A lot of them were, were thieves and, uh, you know, rapists and robbers and all of these kind of sins. And therefore, it gave them a chance of forgiveness and to find, you know, penance. It was a big thing for them. Not to say, of course, other people didn't participate. They also did. Uh, members of the clergy, you know, important people. Uh, saying that, however, the, 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 the clergy did not physically participate in the battles, uh, but you had also other people who were out there for secular purposes, also seeking land, seeking wealth, and people, of course, fought for different reasons. Um, but when it was launched, the state of the Muslims in that time was one of division, right? Not only because between the Sunni and the Shia, but also between, uh, just like for Al-Andalus, for example, in Balad sham in Syria, you had division between the Muslims of uh, Halab, of Aleppo, and the Muslims of Damascus. Right, you had uh, Muslim 
uh, princes fighting against one another. In fact, when the Crusaders arrived in Bilad al-Sham, the two sons of, uh, of Malik Shah, Bir Karuk and Muhammad, were in fact fighting against one another. And this being said, uh, there was also some con circumstantial things that really uh, alleviated uh, the problems uh, facing the Muslims. One was that in the year 1092, it was a year, in fact, called the year of the death of the Khalifs. And that is because in that one year, or in fact, within one or two years, 1092, you had the death of uh, Nizam al-Mulk. Nizam al-Mulk was the Seljuk wazir who had been wazir for 30 years, and he dies. Uh, and that really was uh, that was really a, a big loss you know, for the Muslims, and it was something that would really uh, affect the political solidarity of the Muslims of Bilad uh, A month later, the Seljuk Sultan Malik Shah himself then dies. Uh, and then 1094, you had the death of the Fatimid Wazir Badr al-Jamali, he dies. And then a, a short while after him, uh, the, the Fatimid Khalif uh, al-Muqtadi, in fact, dies. And then after him, in the same year, the, the Sunni Khalif al-Mustansar, he dies. So you had five major political leaders dying within one or two years. Uh, and this was right at the time when the ideas of the crusade are coming through, particularly in, in Al-Andalus. And now, of course, when the crusaders arrive, they're going to find the Muslim world like that. And so therefore, they really had that advantage of coming down to Jerusalem in that state. Uh, Muslims, of course, uh, in that situation of weakness, are really prey you know, to the crusaders. And they're coming down, and the account of the crusaders, it was a bloodbath committed uh, you know, by the Crusaders in, in Beit al-Maqdis from all accounts. Um, in Ibn Athir's account, the, the numbers were 70,000. They range from 30,000, 70,000 uh, massacred uh, in the city of Jerusalem as the Crusaders are Arabi. Not to say, of course, all the all the deaths of Muslims along the way because Crusaders are taking the coastlines you know, of Beirut and Sidon and, uh, and so on and so forth. And so when they get to Al-Quds, it's a bloodbath, and, and the rallying cry really for Crusaders is uh, the word dus vult. Dus vult in Latin means God wills it, God wills it. Uh, and this is carrying through. In fact, it's interesting that in the Spanish Inquisition, uh, the ra rallying cry of the um, uh, Spanish uh, Grand Inquisitor, uh, what was his name? Uh, Thomas de Tocamada, right, who took his learning, of course, from uh, Nicolas Emeric from his Directorum Inquisitorium, the rallying cry was Dios la quer, Dios la quer. And Dios la quer means God wills it, right? So the same rallying cry of the Crusades, Dios vult, was the same rallying cry of the Spanish Inquisition. In Spain, Dios la quer meaning God wills it to happen, so let it be, God wills it. And in the name of that, they committed a complete bloodbath in account of Albert of Aachen, the German chronicler, they would smash the heads of babies against the walls. You know, the, 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 and by the way, the account that you find in Jester Frank Corum, Deeds of the Franks, uh, that the blood was you know, up to the horses and of the, of the knees of the horses, is not a, a, a real account. I mean, it's not exactly like that. But what they're trying to say is that remember that the account, the chronicles were written to appeal to audiences back home who could not attend the Crusades, participate in the Crusades, Therefore, these stories, like the, the, the streets were soaked in the blood of the Muslims, are, are literally true because there was a bloodbath, but they served a different purpose, and that was to show the Christians or back home in Europe, in France, that, uh, they, that God kind of levied such a vengeance against these uh, heathen Muslims. Uh, it's like the stories of the Old Testament when God destroyed nations, and that's the purpose behind some of these accounts. Uh, in any case, it was a complete massacre of the Muslims. Uh, they kept, of course, some Muslims uh, like farmers because they needed knowledge about the agriculture and how to work the fields and the lands. Uh, but then from that point onwards begins the, ki the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, the Muslim world is still in its situation. And that, this is why, you know, one of the things you'll see again and again in, the, in, this, in all these accounts is the is a great tragedy of the farrak, the great tragedy of division. Uh, may Allah save us from that and give us, you know, a, a grant the ummah unity. May Allah give us a mindset to always think about unity, you know, to always think about in our communities, in our masajid, in our homes, always to think 
about how we're going to unify our affairs and come, become strong and not to allow small petty disputes to fragment and divide us as a people, as a nation, as the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so in the first few decades, there was very minimal responses. In fact, the first responses came, came in fact from poets. My book, my first, my book, my my me my 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 piece my doctorate in fact was on the Muslim poetry composed uh, you know at that time this was my my published book on on the Muslim uh, poetry composed in that time and so I have a specific chapter on the first Crusade poetry and you had only three uh, three main accounts one was from a man called Ibn Khayyat one was Abu Mawfar al Abi Waradi one was an anonymous poet and and the kind of things they're saying are like Kaifa Tanamul Ain. How can the eye sleep at a time like this that would awaken any sleeper? You know, when your brothers are sleeping in the bellies of vultures, you know, or Ibn Khayyab says, Ahal al Kufr bil Islam al Dayman, Yatulu Alihi din al Najib, Fahakun Dai one Wahman Wahman Mubahun, was safe and called the honor with Sabib. He's saying like everything is inverted, everything is overturned, like everything that was previously impermissible is now permissible, meaning the sanctity, the hurma of the Muslim women has now become, you know, uh, you know, it's like free game, you know, f- for them. Uh, everything that we once saw that was protected is now being violated. And so this is, um, these were the accounts, but even though you had Muslim poets who were raising their voices, in fact, this poem of Al-Abi Wardi, the one that I recited, was carried by the um, the faqih of Damascus, uh, Abu Sayyid al-Harawi, who traveled with a contingent to, to Baghdad to appeal for assistance from the Khalif. And he recited the poem of Al-Abi Wardi. You know, either that or Abi Wardi was there with him. I'm not entirely sure, but that's the poem that was recited. Uh, but it just didn't, it just didn't have an effect. On the, on the power base of the Muslims in Baghdad, it didn't have an effect. And so they were left to their, to their own their own fate, the Muslims of Bilad al-Sham. Uh, you also had a very, very important person called Ali ibn Tahir al-Sulami. And Ali ibn Tahir al-Sulami was a Shafi'i faqih of the, of, the, uh, of the Grand Mosque of Damascus. He was uh, very learned. He was a grammarian. And what he did is he, he wrote a book called Kitab al-Jihad, the book of the jihad, uh, in which he... Uh, you know, lamented the circumstance of the Muslim Ummah, which are put into division, but he also realized, he, he identifies that the Crusaders are not interested only in Beit al-Maqdis. There is a strategy. They have Sicily, they have Spain, and then they have Jerusalem, and then they're seeking further conquest. And he outlined, therefore, this, this strategy of the Crusaders. Uh, second to that, uh, Sulemi called for the Muslim political body, the Muslim Khalif, uh, to to you know, wage uh, a jihad against the Crusaders to recover Jerusalem. He called upon the able-bodied Muslims to do the same thing. Uh, his text was uh, was not very popular. We know that from the Sama'a tradition. We know that from the the, the, the listenings to the Hadith. Uh, you know, we have uh, manuscripts that have survived of the certificates of 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 who attended which gatherings to listen to which Hadith. It's very interesting, and so his public uh, readings of his text were not very well attended in that early time, but I'll tell you something that happens at the end, 1187, uh, connected to Al-Sulami, uh, inshallah, you know, in, in a few minutes. Uh, but in any case, uh, that's what happened. So the, the response was minimal. Uh, political response was really quite absent until the 1140s. The 1140s comes along, and what happens is that the ruler of Mosul, Imaduddin Zengi, uh, who was... Uh, you know, he, he recaptured the state of, uh, of Roha, of Edessa. And that was a crusader state, a major crusader state. And what that did is therefore, you know, from that point onwards, it really transformed in the minds of Muslims that, uh, that perhaps victory is possible, even as far as recovering Jerusalem. If we're able to recapture the crusader state of Edessa, then what's to say? Maybe one day, inshallah, we could in fact recover Jerusalem. And the, the, the language of jihad, even in the poetry, begins to change. It's now very much focused on recovery. So poets like Ibn Munir al-Tarabulsi of Ibn al-Qaysarani 
uh, major poets are coming out now. In fact, in this time, uh, urging the Muslims, you know, to, for for jihad, for 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 recapturing Jerusalem, uh, and things are beginning, in fact, to change. But they don't change with Imad al-Din Zengi, uh, who, in fact, himself was then assassinated shortly after. But they change with his son, remarkable person, Nuruddin Mahmud Zengi. Uh, Mahmud was his name. Nuruddin was his title. And Nuruddin really was a remarkable figure. What made him so remarkable is that he's actually now taking on from what was happening in the social atmosphere of Bilad al-Sham during this time was something else. And that is that you had the great influence of Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, who dies in 1111. Uh, but what he does is that in the same year as the Crusaders launched in 95, he has a spiritual transformation. He travels from... Um, from Baghdad, I think it was, to Jerusalem. And that's where he has his, and he writes much of his Ahiya al Madin in Jerusalem. But going from uh, uh, where he was in Tuz to Nishapur to uh, Baghdad and then to Jerusalem, uh, these were points where uh, Al-Ghazali, in fact, is realizing that the problem of the Muslim Ummah is not only because of its political or military weakness, but also because of the fact that there is sectarian infighting amongst the Muslims. In fact, in his time, you had you had battles in the streets of Baghdad, even in in, in Bilad al-Sham, between the Atharis and the uh, Ash'aris, between the Hanabil and the Hanab. You know, you had people fighting in the streets. You even had sometimes people being killed because of that. And he's realizing, therefore, that that's a tragedy. Second thing is that uh, Al-Ghazali was realizing something else and that is his own personal development that the things that he's doing is he doing them sincerely for allah right because there's so much uh like uh, competitiveness amongst the ulama amongst the scholars and amongst students of knowledge and is showing off and these things and he realized that this is defeating the purpose of our learning in fact imam ghazali writes that that the the knowledge that does not uh draw you closer to allah in this life will not distance you from the fire in the next life, right? Al-Ghazali is right. He said, إِنِّي فَكَرْتُ He says, إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ I, I saw, نَظَرْتُ إِلَى الْخَلْقِ وَرَأَيْتُ كُلُّ مَحْبُوبًا وَمَعْشُوكًا I, I looked upon creation and I saw everybody's in love with something and somebody. And he says that at the end, I, I realized that the, the best thing to be in love with that will be accompany you in your grave is your good deeds. Right? And I, so I took them, therefore, as my beloved ones, so they would be, uh, be befriend, comfort, comfort me in my grave. And anyway, the whole point is that he's going through this change. But Nuruddin Zengi is now taking from this. And this is seeping through the culture, right? It's like an, it's like an Akhira-centric culture. To focus, make Akhira your, your central focus in life. And this has a great, great effect, in fact, on the culture uh, you know, of the what you call the counter-crusade or the anti-Frankish jihad. And so... Uh, what Nuruddin does, therefore, he's known, the poet calls him, Dhul Jihadin min aduwin wa nafs fa huwa tool al hayati fi hayjai. Ya Malik al Adal, alladhi alzum al nas, the city al Khulafai. He says, Nuruddin was Dhul Jihadin. He fought two jihads, two struggles, one against the enemy and one against himself, <laughs> one against his nafs. Right? <laughs> we, that, it's really profound, in fact. The Nuruddin Zengi is just remarkable, subhanAllah. Right? And he carried this through. Right. So, you know, in his life, for example, he was known as someone who was very ascetic, very devout. I have a published chapter called, uh, you know, it's published in a book called the, um, the uh, it's here somewhere in the book, but it's called the, uh, uh, there's a cultural, you know, dimension of the, of the, of the counter crusade. Uh, and so I have a chapter on the, this ascetic warrior ethos of Nuruddin Zengi. I have, I have a similar chapter in, in my published book here. Uh, but the whole point is true that Nuruddin really carried this sense of uh, of, of twin fold jihad with him. Uh, he was very ascetic, very pious. He kept the night prayers. Uh, he gave stipends to the poor people who were remained in the masajid making dua. Nuruddin was someone who was very concerned about himself and about aggrandizement. In fact, once a, a person said to him, Nuruddin, why do you? Why don't you stay back home? You don't have to fight with us because if you get killed then we have no chance against the Crusaders. And Nuruddin says, وَمَنْ مَحْمُودْ أَنْ يُقَالَهُ هَذَا وَمَنْ حَفْظُ الْإِسْلَامِ مِنْ قَبْلِ ذَلِكَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ And who is Mahmud, meaning myself, that such a thing is said about him, right? And who protected Islam before me? 
That was Allah. And there is none that is worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Once Nur al-Din, in fact, he used to have uh, high taxes. He used to charge people high taxes. And so once a poet came to him and said, Ya Nur al-Din, he says, Ya Nur al-Din, O Nur al-Din, Mada taqul idha waqafta bi mawqifin faradan dhalil wal hisabu asiru wa ta'allakad fi mal khusumu wa anta fi yawm al hisabi musalsal al majruru wa tafadakad anku al junood wa anta fi adhik al quburu musul al maqburu Ya Nur al-Din, mahid li nafsika hujat tanju biha yawm al ma'adi wa yawm al tabdu al uru He says, Ya Nur al-Din, what would you say? Mada taqul when you're standing alone before Allah, right? And you have nothing, right? You're completely, you have nothing. And your account that day was going to be hard for you. What would you say, Nur al-Din, when you're in your grave, six foot down in the earth, and your army is not with you? What would you say, Nur al-Din, then? He says, Nur al-Din, prepare for yourself an excuse before Allah. You know, mahid al prepare for yourself excuse before Allah on a day when things will be difficult and hard for you. And he immediately reduced the taxes, you know. And so therefore he had this great sense of, uh, of piety about him, Nur al-Din Zengi, but he also had a vision. And that's the key thing about Nur al-Din. So one, of course, was realizing that we have to fight against crusaders. And he's, of course, fighting many battles against the crusaders. But number two, to realize that the, the victory is not won only on account of our military strength. Remember the advice that uh, Umar al-Khattab gives to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas on the Battle of Qadisiyah. When he said to Sadiq Abu Waqas, he said, uh, he said, Inni uh, 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 he said, I inni, I, I warn you uh, uh, from the sins of your enemy, right? Because he says that the sins of your enemy, because the sins of your enemy are more deadly to you than your enemy. The sins of your army are more deadly to you than your enemy is, right? Because if you're sinning against Allah and you have no sense of shame, I mean, that's just how it is, uh, and there's no toba, there's no rectification, no remorse, nothing, then you're weakening your internal state. And if your internal state is weakened, then your collective state is weakened. And Nur al-Din really focused on this. He would tell these people to come pray jama'ah in the masjid. Right? And remember that Salah al Ayyubi, by the way, is going to be born in this time because he's born 1137. 1137, uh, you know, is an important time because you have these two key dates. One was 1130, I think, 1133. What happened is that uh, Salah al father, Najm al Ayyub, is um, in Tikrit, where he's in Baghdad, in, in, Tikrit, in Iraq. And him and his uh, brother, Shirku, are expelled from Tikrit because. Uh, Shirku, uh, you know, kills a um, uh, kills somebody, a, a Christian scribe, if I remember. Although there was a context to this, but in any case, as a punishment, uh, he had to be expelled, and he's expelled with his brother Najibuddin Ayyub. And on the day they're leaving, uh, Salah al-Din Ayyubi is born. On the day they're leaving, right? He's, he's born. Um, now, what happens is that. Uh, during the time when, so when they're leaving, what happens is that they end up actually going to uh, Aleppo, right, which was a place that was run by Nuruddin Zengi. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, why that happened. And I'll tell you why, because in 11, a few years before that, when the um, Imaduddin Zengi, the father of Nuruddin Ayyubi, uh, used to make these raids into Baghdad, right? And once he was slowed down and he was prevented, he ends up in Tikrit. Right, and to greet the governor of Tikrit is going to be uh, Najm al-Din Ayyub, the father of Salah al-Din, before Salah al-Din is even born, and he gives him safe passage. He keeps him safe, and he gives him safe passage back to uh, back to uh, Mosul, I think it was, maybe Mosul or Aleppo. Uh, in any case, we we do wonder why, because uh, remember these are two dynasties, like they weren't always and on the best of terms, the Zengids and the Ayyubids. And we don't know why that happened, but in any case, he does that. Uh, and then, of course, the, pay, the favor is repaid in 1137 on the day that uh, Salah al-Din Ayyubi is born. And when uh, Najib al-Din Ayyub and his brother Shirku have to leave, uh, they're called over to Aleppo by uh, Imad al-Din Zengi, and they kept there. And so Salah al-Din Ayyubi, therefore, is born, and he's, and he's in that environment that is already shaped and furnished uh, you know, with that spiritual focus of Nuruddin 
Zengi. And it's so beautiful because that really, he really becomes, you might say, a, a really an educator you know, for him. He's, he's being raised in an environment of piety. He's being taught in the same schools Nuruddin Zengi is building. In fact, he, he's making this, uh, madr- this, he has this Madaris building program. And one of the purposes behind it is because of the importance of Fadail al-Quds. Right, and so that's one of my, my my big areas. Alhamdulillah, that the in 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 the 12th century, the in in the major city centers of Sham, ba- Baalbek, and Damascus, and Hama and Homs, you have these madrasas. And so what Nuruddin Zengi does is that he really capitalizes on this. So you have the Nizamiya madrasas from Nizam al Mulk, and he's introducing into the madrasas uh, new learning. Uh, of the importance of, of Jerusalem. Books of Fadail al-Quds, Fadail al-Sham, Fadail al-Dimash, some old ones like Al-Raba'i and Al-Wasati are already there. New ones are coming out like As-Sama'ani, for example. And they're being taught to this new generation of people who had never been to Jerusalem now because that from 1099 they took Jerusalem. Now it's in the 11, you know, 60s and 1170s. And so therefore... Uh, this work is being done. Salah Hadin is being raised in this environment. He's learning from this in the same schools. He's memorizing Quran. He's learning Hadith. In fact, Salah Hadin was known as being so connected to Hadith. He would kind of shadid al buka in the Sumat Hadith. He would be he would cry a lot when Hadith were recited. He would, in fact, later on when he had his own children, he would you know go with his children and sit in the gatherings of of Hadith studies and listen to Hadith and Quran recited. Uh, Salah Hadin is learning things like horsemanship and archery and about battle, about battles, uh, you know, from the uh, from from Nuruddin and from the from the governors of, of Nuruddin Zengi. Uh, so therefore, he has you know deep access to this environment that he's is being raised in. Um, and so Salah Hadin, in his early age, therefore, is is really immersed in this in this culture. Um, uh, Nuruddin Zengi, of course. He has this great vision, and his vision is, is based upon three points. And the vision was, number one, that you have to defeat the Fatimid Shia empire of Egypt. And that was really seen as a thorn because the Fatimids, um, not only because Egypt was extremely important, you had the port of Damietta in the north of Egypt, uh, whoever has access to the ports really has access to everything, because and, and Egypt was very powerful as a country, but because they, they were allying with the Crusaders you know, against the Sunni Muslims. And so he believed, therefore, they had to be defeated. Uh, it wasn't always like that because he even sent uh, Shirku, uh, uh, Najim Adin, uh, Salah Adin's uncle, uh, to reinstate the, the Fatimid wazir. Uh, but then, again, treachery was seen from them. And then he uh, he sent Salah Adin and Shirku to defeat them. The, the last Fatimid Khalif, al Adid, died in 1170. Uh, and uh, thereafter that, then it always remained as a, as a Sunni empire, the, the kingdom of, of Egypt. Uh, but he believed before that, that that was a key point uh, to, to essentialize the vision of the Muslims to defeat the Fatimids empire of Egypt. Number two, uh, he believed that there has to be unity in Syria, in Sham, that it was impossible, he believed, for them to have a chance of recovering Jerusalem if Aleppo and Damascus are in division. Because the Crusaders, as they did in Andalus, right, would just pick one against the other. In Al Andalus, I mean, it's horrific. So all these major states of, you know, Jais and 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 uh, and Seville and Cordoba, and Toledo, major states of the Muslims are now being f- picked against one another, right? And they're paying annual tributes to the Christian powers, right, for their for to defend them. And it's just horrific. It's horrific what happened in Al Andalus, but in uh, in, in Sham, that was a worry, and that was the affair of Nuruddin, that if Aleppo and Damascus remain divided, they would uh, pay tributes to the Crusaders against one another. That's going to embolden the Crusaders, and then therefore the whole spirit of, of resistance against the Crusaders in recovering Jerusalem is going to be lost. And so he believed that there has to there has to be an effort to do that, and he made an amazing Supana effort. To, 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 in fact, he came back into Damascus with such peace uh, with, the, with the idea that I don't want any blood to be spilled in Damascus. He builds uh, 11 more madaris in Damascus. There was 11 when he when he came in. There was 22 when he dies in 1174. 
Uh, and then number three in his vision was effort to recapture Jerusalem, focus, right? So to have more of these books of Fadha'il al-Quds, what he does is he builds a minbar. It's an it's a amazing thing. Anybody who's been to Bet al-Maqdis and to Al-Aqsa uh, would see that in, in Masjid al-Aqsa, in the, uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the prayer place, there is a, uh, a minbar. And uh, that minbar is known as the minbar of Salah Hadin. It's not the exact, it's a replica. So if you go to the Museum of Al-Aqsa, you'll see the exact minbar, but the remaining, the remnants of it, because it was burnt, the whole mosque, in fact, was set on fire and the minbar uh, by an Australian uh, fanatic, the Zealot Christian fanatic uh, in 1160s, sometime 1160s or 1770s. And so the uh, the minbar then was rebuilt uh, because the minbar, in fact, when it was by, by, by built by Nuruddin, it had no nuts and bolts. It was all interconnected pieces and it's an amazing piece of, of handiwork. Um, and so why does he build that? He builds this fantastic minbar and he stations it in Aleppo. And he says that when we recapture Jerusalem, then we will bring this minbar and place it into Masjid al-Aqsa, right? And it was kind of just a sense of, a kind of a sense of hope that he was giving the Muslims of Bilad al-Sham that look, we have built the minbar and that's just showing us therefore that it's, it's, it's gonna come soon we just have the minbar already there. <laughs> so when we capture al, al- Bet al uh, we're going to bring down the, the minbar uh, and place it in al and al But it's, that's what happened. But it was Salah al Ayyub, in fact, who brought the minbar down from uh, Aleppo to Bet al when he recaptured 1187. And so, I mean, that's what happened. So Nuruddin, therefore, had this remarkable uh, character about him, and he's raising really Nuruddin, sorry, raising Salah in his in his early age, uh, you know, with this with this great capacity of understanding uh, the importance of unity for the Muslims. Of understanding the importance of self-rectification, right? <laughs> this is really affecting Salah Hadin. Salah Hadin grows up really, uh, you know, with a, with a great sense of discipline about him. And Salah Hadin again was known as somebody who was very, very connected to that. Um, Salah Hadin, he makes his focus. So therefore, the fact that now Aleppo and Damascus are unified and, and Egypt is under, under control, you also had small fractions of those who opposed and they, had, and they were rebelling. Salah Hadin realizes the importance of, of quashing those rebellions, uh, which in any case sometimes meant fighting against those Muslim uh, rebellious groups uh, for the sake of sustaining the ambition for a greater unity of purpose. And that did happen, for, in fact, for many years. Uh, but then, of course, that part became clearer for him uh, towards the focused energy of recovering Jerusalem. They would say about him, like Surah Hadin, Kanakal Walid al Thakla, Yajul bi Farisi min Talib ila Talib, Yunadi yal al Islam, yal al Islam. Surah Hadin was like a bereaved mother, knowing that this holy sanctity of Bait al Maqdis, the third most important site of, of Islam, is in the Crusader hands like a bereaved mother, and he would ride in his horse from place to place and say, oh, Islam, oh, Islam. I mean, he had this real sense of, of passion about him. They would say, like, Salah Hadin had lived a very simple life of frugality, right? And they would say, why don't you enjoy yourself? And he would say, How can it please me to eat nice food and drink nice drinks? Right when Jerusalem is in the hands of the Crusaders, he had this sense about him. He was like, you know, for kind of uh, um, uh, a bit, kind of uh, uh, they said, uh, Amrun Azim. Like for him, it was a, a great matter that Jerusalem was in the hands of the Crusaders, and therefore he made a, a very, very purpose effort to fight the Crusaders. And he, and this is really what he's known for. And so Salah Hadin, aside from his character being very frugal. Uh, being very connected, pious, he emphasized on praying in the masajid, uh, the five daily prayers. He emphasized on on praying your sunan darawat. These are things that, in fact, he learned from Nuruddin. Nuruddin emphasized upon his character the importance of qiyam al layl, of praying the night prayers, the hajjad. In fact, Salahuddin would give like these stipends to uh, the people who are in the masajid, and people would say, "Why are you giving money to those people? They're not even fighting in, in the battlefield. They're just..." old and they're in the mosque and Salah Hadin would say things like uh, how could I change how could I give money take how could I take money from a people 
وَإِنِّي نَائِمْ فِي فَرَاشِي how, how could I uh, take money from a people who fight uh, the enemy when I'm asleep in my bed and give it to a people who only fight for me when they see me? And he's saying, therefore, that they have arrows that بِسِحَامْ تُخْطَعْ وَتُصِيبْ He says, you have arrows that hit and miss their targets. They have arrows that never miss their targets, meaning <laughs> their, their du'as never miss their targets. You know, and so... Meaning he's saying that, you know, we, and, and in the hadith in Sayyid Muslim, it says, Allah will aid this ummah bi da'ifiha, bi da'watim wa ikhlasim wa niyatim. Or Kama Qal, he says that Allah will aid this ummah with its weak ones. Also, you know, with its weak ones, with their du'as and their sincerity. Uh, I think it's niyatim, I'm not sure, but it's definitely, it has bi da'watim wa ikhlasim with their sincerity and their du'as. And so you realize, therefore, that a whole a comprehensive nature of the struggle requires all of these different uh, parameters to, and elements to be in place. Um, it was someone who was known as being uh, in a soft nature. There was once, for example, and I'll mention when we get to, inshallah, the point about Acre. But in any case, in Salah Adin, he makes that his focus, to carry on with the tradition of, of Nur al-Din Zangi. Uh, he has justice in his character. So they would say, like the poet said, um, he said, uh, Ya Salah Adin, qad aslahta dunya dunya shaqiyan lam yabit illa harisa. وَأَرْسَلْتَ سَلَامَ لَنَا عُمُومًا وَجُودُكَ جَعْنِي وَحْدِ خُصُوصًا فَكُنْتَ كَيُوسُفَ الصِّدِّيقِ لَمَّا تَلَقَّى مِنْهُ يَقُوبَ الْقَمِيصَ He says, Nuruddin, he said, because his name was, of course, Yusuf, Yusuf ibn Ayyub, and he said, Salah Adin, you've, you've really replaced, you've really altered things, you know, that things that were unjust and, 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 and not good, you've made them uh, places of, of reform now. And you're like... Uh, and, and he says uh, that your salam came to all the people, but to me, the poet is saying it came specifically. And you're like Yusuf, right? When when you bring the, the when when the shirt of Yusuf is brought upon Yaqub, and of course he was blind and he could see again. Therefore, you're, you're bringing this new sense of of legacy amongst us. And Salahuddin, therefore, was someone who was was known, you know, for that. He was uh, therefore committed. Now, the, the key thing that I know we don't have. Uh, all the time, uh, but but Salah Adin al Ayyubi, one of the key moments, you know, for him, really culminated uh, in the 1180s. And so, 1183, there was a horrific thing that happened called the Red Sea incursion. That's when one of the really rebellious crusaders called Reynold de Chatillon, who was in fact imprisoned by Nuruddin Zengi uh, in Aleppo uh, for many years uh and then when he was released he had this newfound hatred against islam and the muslims he he uh he travels to and he would in fact attack muslim pilgrims uh you know coming back from the hajj uh, that's something he would do uh 1183 he, he takes his naval fleet and they travel all the way to the hijaz they were just miles away from the blessed city of of, of nabi Sallam in medina right and he had this crazy uh, idea of trying to dig up the Prophet's body and carrying it to to Europe and charging people to see it. And, and Salah Hadin, he sent his uh, naval expert, uh, Hussam Adin Lutlu, to repel this, which of course he was successful in this. But from that point on, was he had this deeply entrenched hatred against this Shaytan, Reynold de Chatillon. Um, and so what happens is that in the uh, winter of 1186, 1187, uh, there was a truce between Salah Adin and the Crusaders, a crusader called Reynold, Raymond of Tripoli, and that truce was broken by Reynold de Chatillon because he attacks a Muslim caravan traveling between uh, Egypt and Syria. Uh, he attacks the caravan, he steals the goods as well. That broke the truce, right? And so Raymond de Tripoli is really panicking because he's thinking, well, you know, Salah Adin is in a very strong position at this point in time. Remember that Salah Adin had amassed an army loyal to the Khalif, not for his own sake or his own name, but to the Khalif from the from the, the Jazeera, from Aleppo, from Egypt, from Syria. And so a wide ranging army speaking different languages, even sometimes different ethnicities, uh, but they were all purpose to fight in the in the, in the war against the Crusaders. Um, and in fact, he would emphasize in his letters, this is not a struggle for myself. This has to be done in the name of the Khalif. It was to, to emphasize the importance of, of political authority, political unity. And so, uh, so what happened is, therefore, when he's uh, now in that position, when Raymond, uh, Raymond Chatelon 
is making these uh, attacks against the Muslims, uh, Salah Hadin, what he does is that he, he lays siege to the, the, the castle of Karak. At the same time, his brother Al uh, Afdal, he travels to um, Acre, right? Now, there's two things happening here. So one is going to uh, Karak, one is going to Acre. Uh, the Knights Templar, the Knights Templars, the Crusaders had military orders, Knights Templars and Hospitallers. And these were like the SAS, these were like uh, military, uh, you know, experienced soldiers, but also who were like very disciplined monks, right? They were very ascetic and they were very uh, severe in, against the Muslims, and they were very, I mean, the initial role, in fact, was to defend pilgrims traveling from Europe to Jerusalem, but then it changes a very, very deep hatred against Islam that they had. And so what they did is that they panicked. In Nazareth, they panic, you know, in the, in the West, in the, in the West Bank, in the north of Palestine, they panic, and they take 400 Knights nice Templars, and they uh, fight against a much larger Muslim force, force of 7,000 Muslims in a place called the Springs of Cresson. Uh, it was a complete defeat. Only four of these Knights Templars survived, right? And so that's really now worrying the Crusaders, thinking, you know, this is terrible because Salah Hadin is now back in, in, in the forefront. We've broken the truce against him. Uh, he's in Karak. Uh, we have his brother in, uh, in, um, in Acre. Uh, what do what do we do? So they, what they did is that they for they they traveled to a place called Sephoria. Sephoria again is just thirty kilometers west of Tiberias. So if Tiberias is towards the east, right, and Sephoria is more towards the west, thirty kilometers between them. Uh, but it was a good place to be because it was a very large water supply, right? And so the Crusaders are there; they're all there, right? So Raymond of Tripoli is there, the King of Jerusalem, Gidi Suyon is there. Uh, this Shaitan, uh, Reynold the is there, Raymond of Tripoli is there, Knights nice Templar, they're all there, and Safariya. And Salahuddin, what he does is he uh, sends his army and himself goes towards Tiberias. They go to Tiberias. Tiberias, of course, has a great water supply as well. When they're in Tiberias, a Muslims who are scouting the area realize there is a castle. That castle is being guarded by a woman called Ashiva. Ashiva, in fact, is the wife of Raymond. Of Tripoli, and they didn't know that. They didn't know that in this castle there is, in fact, the wife of the key crusader, Raymond of Tripoli, who was just 30 kilometers away in, in Safaria. And so they laid siege to that castle, right, of uh, uh, in Tiberias. Now it's panic because now that when the, new, when the news reaches uh, the crusaders in Safaria that Raymond of Tripoli's wife is now being besieged in that castle in, uh, in Tiberias, there's panic. But there's not real panic from Raymond because he knows that Salah al Ayyubi has a character of magnanimity. He would never harm a woman like that. I mean, they, they knew that about him. Uh, and so him and the king of Jerusalem, Gideon Yisrael, they realize that maybe it's like a ruse. He's trying to draw us out from Safaria, out from the water, and towards Tiberias, right? Maybe they realize that. Therefore, they went to sleep that night, 2nd of July, 1187, uh, saying that, you know what, let's just stay where we are. But that evening, the evening of the 2nd of July, uh, the master, grand master of the Knights Templars, a man called Gerard de Reitford, and the shaitan, uh, Reynold de Chatelon, came knocking on the, on the door of the King of Jerusalem in that night, saying, you know what, we need to leave here, and we have to go and fight Salah in uh, in uh, in, uh, in Tiberias, right? Uh, now, one of the reasons why that was being done, I'll tell you, is because the Grand Master of the Templars, this was the Grand Master, General Reifert, and you just had the complete annihilation of those 400 Knight Templars in the springs of Cresson. Therefore, he had an axe to grind, you know, uh, against Salah uh, Second reason is because uh, every year, the, the King of England, Henry II, had been sending uh, annual payments. You know why? Because if you, uh, maybe you've done it in school, uh, we do it in school, and that's because it is the, because he, there was an Archbishop of Canterbury called uh, Thomas Beckett, and Thomas Beckett was an was not the Archbishop, but he but he, but the King of England wanted him to become the Archbishop. He refused because he realized it's going to be used, you know, and it's going to be ungodly and everything else. Um, uh, two bishops, as far as I know, uh, overheard uh, Henry II speaking negatively about. Uh, Thomas Beckett, 
and then they had him killed. This really uh, upset uh, Tom, uh, the King of England a lot, and then he, he sent like payments every year, you know, to be used uh, against the fight against the Muslims. Uh, and so what what had happened is that that payment had in fact been uh, had been spoiled, had been uh, had been grabbed and taken prematurely by Gerard de Wrightford and Reynolds uh, Shuttle. Therefore, they were hiding that secret. They actually had that money. And they needed to fight, uh, therefore, against Salah Haddin. In any case, uh, first it was resistance, and then at the end, they went with that decision. And then by the morning of July the 3rd, uh, they made the decision collectively to, to leave uh, the Safariya and travel to Salah Haddin in Tiberias. And that was, that's what Salah Haddin's plan and aim was. That's a big problem because even though it's 30 kilometers, not too far, but it's very, 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 very hot, extremely hot. You know the the the, uh, the month of July very very hot. Uh, therefore, they have let no access to water. Salah Hadin he poisons the wells en route, so they don't have access to water even. And some are dying on the way. Some are going back home, returning back. Uh, some are like just collapsing because of fatigue. Uh, Salah Hadin uh, ignites uh, bush fires, and these fires, the smoke is blowing in the direction of the Crusaders. Right. So you just imagine that. Number one, they have no access to water. Number two, horses have no access to water. Number three, the world wells are poisoned. Number four, uh, the the smoke fire is coming, you know, in, in their faces, and that's exacerbating the heat as well, right? And so uh, by the time they get to where Salah Adin wants them to be, they end up in you know in a hill called the Horns of Hattin, and and there there is the, the in a, this a remarkable battle takes place between the Christians and the, and the Muslims in the Battle of Hattin where the Crusaders are completely defeated. Uh, in fact, Al-Isfahani... <coughs> Al-Imad Al-Isfahani, one of Salah Hadin's biographers and chroniclers, uh, writes that the number of dead were so many, we didn't believe anybody had been taken prisoner. And those taken prisoner were so many, we didn't believe anybody had died. And he says they were like hedgehogs. He described them like hedgehogs because of all the arrows on their bodies. And he says that the people of the Trinity were destroyed by the Trinity because he said they were destroyed by the fire, destroyed by the arrows, and destroyed by by thirst. Something like he uses this pun you know, on the on the Trinity. Uh, and any and anyway, uh, remember that the Knights Templars were all there as well, and they also had, by the way, a uh, they they believed they had a, a piece of the true cross. Now this was something very important. Crusaders believed. They had a piece, they had the holy lance in the earlier crusade, uh, where they believe that was the lance that pierced the body of Jesus. And we don't believe that. They also believe they had a, a part of the true cross, which is where they believe Jesus was crucified upon. And again, we don't believe that. Uh, and so they, and they, they would carry that together in the battle with great pride, believing that that's going to promise them victory from God. And so what the Crusaders, they, they, they uh, commissioned the bishops of Lidda to be the ones who are going to protect the true cross. So the Hadin realized that if they could get the true cross, then the morale of the Crusaders would simply uh, you know, dissipate. And that's exactly what happened. So therefore, he commissioned his troops to head straight for uh, the bishops of Lidda, and then they captured the true cross from them. Uh, and and, and just, it was just a complete disaster for them. And and there was a defeat, uh, but the, the battle was enormous because that was the battle, in fact, that then led to uh, the reconquest of Jerusalem 1187. It's, in fact, in the same year. Uh, Salah Hadin al-Ayyubi, uh, you might have seen the scenes, you know, in some of the movies that, uh, you know, in uh, after battle was over, uh, the king of Jerusalem, King Gidi Lusignon, uh, Raymond of Tripoli are there, Raymond of is there, and, and they erect a tent, and, and he gives water to the king of Jerusalem, uh, which he drinks, and then the king gives it to, you know, his friend, this Shaytan, Reynolds Shatilon, and Salah Hadin says, I didn't give him water to drink, and I gave it to you because this is a king from a king to a courtesy, and uh, and uh, then he begins to remind Reynolds Shatilon about his crimes committed against the Muslims, you know, and then he, in fact, invited him to Islam, which he refuses, and then he, uh, he, uh, he, he kind of cuts off his arm, then he pushes him towards the others who, who killed him. Uh, and therefore, that's the promise that he, he wanted to keep and that 
therefore the promise was fulfilled on that day that Reynold Chetelon was then killed on the uh, at that day at the end of the Battle of Hittin. Uh, Salah Hadin had all the Knights Templars executed, right? He had all of them, without any exception, executed on the in the Battle of Hittin, because he believed that the Knights Templars were not the ones where if you if you kind of release them uh, to pay a ransom and to go as prisoners, then they would have a uh, change of heart. No, it's so inbred in them to fight against Muslims that you can't take any, uh, you know, can't you can't take any. Uh, um, what's the word? Like you can't take any uh, any chances, you know, with them, and so all were executed. Uh, the king is exiled, uh, and Salah al-Din al Ayyubi now has his eyes set on recovering Jerusalem. Uh, before that, of course, you also have the coastline to deal with: uh, Sidon, Acre, Tyre, Beirut, you know, and they're capturing these, you know, on route on the way. Uh, and then they get to Bethel Marcus, Jerusalem. Uh, in fact, uh, it, what, it's interesting what happened is that uh, one of the uh, crusaders who fought in the Battle of Hittin was um, was called Balian of Ibelin, you know, a very high-ranking crusader and from a high-ranking family. And Balian of Ibelin, in fact, had a wife uh, called Maria Comnenus, who in fact was the daughter of the Byzantine Emperor Alexis Comnenus, and she was in Jerusalem with her children. And so uh, Balian writes a dispatch to Salah Hadin saying that, uh, can I uh, just take my wife and kids out of Jerusalem? Do I have permission? And Salah Hadin, he says to him, writes to him and says, you have permission on the condition that you will never fight against Muslims ever again. All right? And so he agrees to that. And then he gets to Jerusalem, right, before Salah Hadin does. And, uh, of course, there's no king of Jerusalem anymore. And then the archbishop of Jerusalem uh, says to Balian that you need to be our de facto king and, and, and protect the city of Jerusalem from the Muslims. And he says, we can't because we've just been defeated in Battle of Hittin. And I've made this promise with Salah Hadin to get my wife and kids out. And they said that this, the, all promises with infidels are void. So don't worry about that. Uh, Balian writes another letter to Saladin and said, this is the situation I'm in now, I can't even uh, get out of here. And so, uh, can I still take my wife out, however? And he gives permission, but not only does he let the wife and kids leave Jerusalem, he furnishes them with with food and clothes for the winter, you know, for the coming winter, and he, and he gives them, like, drinks and all of these things. And it was a remarkable reflection of his character, Allah Akbar, that you know his war was not against uh, the wife of uh, uh, Baden of Ibelin, Maria Comnenus, but he showed such courtesy and such discipline, such magnanimity, such humility and mercy, you know, for 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 those people. Uh, and then they left. You know, uh, Baden of course remained in Jerusalem, and then he uh, he ends up making terms with with Salah Hadin that he will not burn down the the Muslim places in Jerusalem on the condition that the Crusaders can leave. Salah Hadini has uh, a ransom plan of 10, 10 dinars for men and five for women and one or two for children, uh, which they paid. And But there were many that could not pay. There were thousands, in fact, who couldn't pay. Salah Hadini allowed them to leave without payment. You know, even his brother, uh, you know, allowed many to, like, especially the elderly, to leave without, without payment. And, and the elderly is a key point here, especially the elderly who couldn't pay, make the payment. And just think about the prophetic character here. You know, Salah Hadini, he entered Jerusalem uh, in, uh, on the night that they say was the night of the Isra and Mi'raj, on the night believed to be the night when the Prophet traveled from uh, Mecca to Bait al-Maqdis and Bait al-Baqdis, Jerusalem. And Allah in the Quran says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, بَلَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ سُبْحَانَ الَّذِي أَسْرَى بِعَبْدِهِ لَيْلًا مِنَ الْمَجْلِ الْحَرَامِ إِلَى الْمَجْلِ الْأَقْصَى الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَهُ لِنُورِهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا إِنَّهُ وَالسَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Allah says that, you know, glory be to him, Allah, who took his servant by night from the sacred precinct of Mecca, the sacred precinct of, of Al-Aqsa. Uh, and then Allah says, um, to show him some of our signs. And with his precinct, Allah is blessed. And what's around it is also blessed. And Allah is all hearing, Allah is all knowing. Uh, so the, the, the moment was so, you know, was so perfect in that sense that he's arriving back into Jerusalem on the same day, on the anniversary of the Prophet's heavenly ascent, you know, of night journey and heavenly ascent, you know, from Beit al-Maqdis. 
And of course, it was an amazing occasion. And so when the Christians therefore are leaving, uh, he honored therefore the, 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 the character. You know, one of the beautiful things about that we learn as Muslims is that, you know, just imagine, you know, when, when, the, when the Prophet ﷺ came from uh, Medina back to Mecca, Fatul Mecca, there would have been, of course, uh, Meccans who would have still, uh, ex- uh, you know, uh, exhibited this sense of fear, you know, for Islam from the Prophet ﷺ because of all the propaganda, the herring from the Meccans of the Mushrikeen against Islam. When the Prophet came back into Mecca, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was an elderly man. This man was the father of Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu. And he was an elderly man. And Abu Bakr came and brought him out from his home to come and you know, accept Islam finally from the, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and when the Prophet saw Abu Bakr do this, bring the old man, the Prophet says to Abu Bakr, he says, he says Halla tadakta shaykh fi baytihi hatta akur ana atihi ilayhi. Why didn't you leave the old man in his home so I could have come out to see him? <laughs> why, why didn't you leave? The old man in his home, so I could have gone out to see him. And Abu Bakr says, he said, he said, he has more of a need to see you, your Rasulullah, than you have to see him. And of course, that's true. But then, the, but the Prophet was showing him, Subhanallah, something so powerful. Then it says, فَأَجْلَسَهُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ And the Prophet sat the old man down before him. ثُمَّ مَسْحَ So then he wiped over his chest. ثُمَّ قَالَ أَسْلِمْ فَأَسْلَمَ Then he said, submit to Allah, and he submitted to Allah. I mean, just look at that sense of courtesy and respect that he gave there. When Salahuddin came back into Jerusalem, there were elderly people who couldn't leave, but he gave them free ransom to, to leave Jerusalem without, without problem. And the people on the, on the march to Jerusalem were remembering that look at what the Crusaders did to us in 1099. Bloodbath, you know, raping of women, killing of children, you know, killing of elderly men, destroying the places. And they thought that you know, we should have revenge, a vengeance against them now. And even the crusaders in the city, in the walls of, in the city of Jerusalem, were thinking that this can be a bloodbath today because of what we did to them, you know, in 88 years ago. Rasul Hadin dealt with them with such mercy and such goodness. Uh, and this was only for the purpose of, of recovering the city for Islam. And it was a beautiful occasion. So when he came back into Jerusalem, the Muslims, they had uh, uh, inscribed on the doors of Beit al-Maqdis, the ayah from, from uh, sorry, of Al-Aqsa Masjid, uh, the, the verse from the Quran, when Allah says, لَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْنِ ذِكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضِ يَرَثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ That we decreed you know, in, the, in the Zabur after the rem- rem- reminder that the earth will be inherited by the pious servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the uh, inner dome of the Qubat al-Sakhra, the, the dome of the rock, in the inner dome, they had inscribed the first 21 verses of Surah Taha, right, the ulama. And so the first 21 of Surah Taha are speaking about Musa alayhi salam. And Allah is saying, you know, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكِ يَا Musa, What is in your hand, O Musa? قَالَ يَا صَعِ It's a stick. And Allah says to Musa, أَلْقِهَا يَا Musa, Throw the stick. And Musa throws the stick, it becomes a serpent. And, and Musa becomes scared. And Allah says on the 21st verse, لَا تَخَفْ سَنُعِيدُهَا سِيرَةَهَا الْأُولَى We will return this back into its original state. And it was like a reflection. That's the verse it ends on. That just they they lost Jerusalem for eighty eight years, and uh, but it's but they shouldn't panic because Allah returned Jerusalem back into its original state. <laughs> it was this reminder, and it's quite it's amazing. I mean, how they even thought of that's the verse we need to have, you know, in uh, in the inner dome of the dome of the rock as a, as a perpetual reminder that that the Muslim Ummah should never panic. One of the poets said, "Al." مَجَلْ أَقْصَ لَهُ عَادَةً سَارَتْ فَصَارَتْ مَثَلًا سَائِرًا إِذَا غَدَالُ الْكُفْرِ مُسْتَوْطَنًا يَبْأَتَ اللَّهُ لَهُ نَاصِرًا فَنَاصِرًا طَهَرَهُ أَوَّلًا وَنَاصِرًا طَهَرَهُ آخِرًا He said, Majl Aqsa has like a way, you know, Allah never allows, um, you know, Allah never allows it to be abandoned. He says that if, if this belief comes upon it, you know, Allah sends it a victor. And the victor came in the first time, Umar ibn Khattab, and the victor came in the second time, Sahadin al Ayyubi. Uh, and of course, it was a great day. Surah Hadin, he brings in Qur'ans, you know, from, from Balad al-Sham to be placed again into Al-Aqsa. He removes all the Christian artifacts from the masjid. All the statues and all of the crucifixes are removed. Uh, they bring in, or he has uh, a rose water, you know, running through the streets of Jerusalem and, and the masjid to kind of freshen the smell and to kind of Islamify 
the city. Um, and then, of course, they, they bring the minbar of, of Nur al-Din Zengi from, from Aleppo uh, back into Al-Aqsa. They, there was an, kind of a bit of an election about who would be the, the khatib who would, who would, uh, uh, who would uh, you know, lead the first uh, salah of, of Juma and they selected the Sheikh Mukhidin ibn al-Zaki uh, to be the and he in fact was the Khalif who was also, in fact was the uh, was the Imam that was there with Salahuddin's death and I think we should go we should try and move on because I know time is going to be against us um but uh now this wasn't the end of the story because you also had then the third crusade and the third crusade so but so when the news reaches Europe that they've lost Jerusalem uh, the Pope urban the third dies he dies, they say, of shock that they've lost the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, the new Pope, Pope Gregory VIII, uh, you know, immediately gathers his people together and they launch uh, a third crusade. Uh, they made a new papal bull called the Auditor Turamendi. The Auditor Turamendi was a papal bull, again, uh, promising indulgence, forgiveness of sins, but this was the biggest crusade launched so far. So you had the first and second crusade. Second crusade was really big, by the way, that was focused on Damascus as well, and you had Bernard of Clairvaux. But the third crusade was the biggest of all the crusades, uh, because this time we had the, the German emperor, Frederick of Barbarossa, you had the French uh, emperor, French king, and you had the English king, King Richard, Richard I, Richard the they call him. Uh, three kings with armies of three countries, all focused on uh, on recapturing Jerusalem, um, and so the the German king Frederick Barbarossa leaves early. He left early, uh, you know, with his army, and they travel there. He gets quite far, uh, passes Asia Minor, uh, but he uh, in fact died. He, he drowned. He drowned, drowned when he was bathing. He he he, he did he didn't make it as far as he wanted to. He drowns, but his but his participation was very very powerful, very important. You know, for the German contingents, uh, the uh, uh, King of uh, France and King of England, they leave later, 1190. Number one is because the previous king, Henry II, I think it was, who had, had died, and therefore election of a king all takes time, and King Richard I is elected. Uh, you had political disturbances as well. But number three, because they needed time to preach the crusade, right? They needed time to do that. And so um, this order tr tremendous was, was being carried out. Uh, you also had, by the way, a thing called the Saladin Tithe. The Saladin Tithe was that in, in England, you know, and in Europe, you had people who had to pay uh, from their own rev income some of their money had to go towards fighting Salahadin. Just imagine that, right? So you had a tithe, you had like, you know, a percentage of their money had to be, had to be given to the war against Salahadin. You had uh, King Richard I was very, very strict, very strict uh, in raising funds for this crusade. And of course, there's a lot of money is needed for that, to pay for the soldiers, to pay for expenditure on the route and so on and so forth. Uh, he even charges Jews, you know, who didn't participate in the crusade, but he's taking money from them to fight against uh, Salah Hadin in the third crusade. And so a lot of preparation, a lot of work, and that's why there was a delay from these two kings. But when these two kings left then, um, there was uh, a focus uh, in, in Acre, and the siege of Acre. And so uh, in, in Acre, what had happened is that the, the remaining crusaders of Jerusalem had focused on, on besieging Acre. Muslims were in Acre, right? Uh, and so when the crusaders made that their focus, these crusading armies are now heading towards Acre. And by the way, the, the crusading armies of Richard and the, and the king of France are also heading towards Acre. Um, it's emboldening them, thinking that our kings are coming. So Hadin realizes that that's a big problem. And so he's, he's encouraging the Muslims to remain fighting in the way of Allah, to give their lives for Allah, not to worry, not to worry. Uh, but it's becoming hard. And that siege lasts two years. The siege of Acre lasts two years. Uh, and they're running out of supplies of food and everything else. Uh, Salah Hadin is trying so hard. They're building new ships. Uh, but sometimes they get... They get broken. Uh, you know, the, the supplies of food don't get there. There's a remarkable stories of, of sacrifice of a very famous uh, man called Isa. Isa was described in the account of Ibn Shaddad 
as somebody who was uh, an excellent swimmer and he's swimming to uh, in the account he was trying to swim to to uh, to uh, he has like a lot of money on him around his waist uh, to get the supplies to the people of uh, who are besieged now in their castle in Acre but he dies en route you know and all of these things are happening um, uh, and so when by the time King Richard gets there in Acre uh, the Muslims uh, they they make a, a promise with with King Richard that they would um, they would leave the city. Uh, pay like twenty thousand something uh, dinars, uh, and, and and a few other things as well. They, they will promise to them, um, which I can't remember quite clearly. Uh, but uh, King Richard agrees to that, but then he goes back on his promise, and he executes all of them. Three thousand of them are beheaded, of these prisoners that were uh, in in Acre at that time. You know, so it was complete betrayal. Of course, it really uh, infuriates uh, Salah al-Din. Um, uh, but the siege of Acre was really had a very uh, damaging blow on the morale of the Muslims. Um, you had the, the Battle of Arsuf as well, that was kind of a bit of a setback for, for the Muslims as well. Uh, and so therefore, it's kind of a bit of, you know, the Crusaders are, are gaining territory from the Muslims, uh, Tyre, Acre. Uh, and uh, and Salah al-Din realizes that one of his purposes has to be to secure the coastline because if they have the coastline, then they're going to have easy access to always bring supplies in to attack Jerusalem. So <coughs> what he does is, therefore, he, um, he, uh, he, he brings his armies. So he's bringing his armies you know, from all places, but this time is very different because the same way the Crusaders were using this very evil propaganda. In fact, uh, in, in Europe, they would carry these uh, pictures showing what Saladin is doing against uh, the Christians to try and you know, uh, spur up the uh, ambition of the Crusaders against the Muslims. It wasn't always working because people, they knew of the magnanimity and the character of Salah Hadin's character uh, but you know, for those who did not know, it was uh, it was a way for them to uh, be further motivated by by the crusade against the Muslims. Salah Hadin had to bring in the Muslim armies, you know, from all these places again: uh, uh, Mesopotamia and Irbil and Mosul. Um, you know, uh, so main. So you had, of course, he had governors in these places, and the whole purpose was bring your armies together. Right from these main locations, uh, and they are and they're responding to. In fact, the Caliph this time is responding to Salah al-Din's attempt because he knows that this is going to be, uh, you know, tr this travesty if we lose if we lose Jerusalem to the Crusaders again. And even the Caliph, therefore, in fact, is responding with money, responding with things. In fact, he's appealing to the. You know what Salah al-Din said to the Caliph? He says, "If you fight with us in this battle, I'll give all of my lands to you." I'll give all of my lands I've captured solely for you if you came out because he knew that the motivation of the Muslims would really rise if they saw the Khalif coming up, but he refused to do that. He just sent money and preparations and other things. And of course, it was a setback for Salahim, but he carried on. He had such a re resolve to carry on with that. You know, I mean, he didn't give up. He just he had this, um, this remarkable sense of energy and spirit in him, you know, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and so, uh, you know, the Crusaders at the end of the day, I mean, it's a longer thing, but they realized that King Richard realized that uh, even on his way to Jerusalem, he realized that the, there wouldn't be much point because the fortifications of the, of the coastlines uh, would mean that uh, Jerusalem will always be well defended by the Muslims, right? And so what Saladin would do, therefore, is that he would, in fact, destroy the fortification on the on the coastline, like the castles and stuff, because he felt that if the Crusaders took them, then they couldn't defend them because the fortifications are destroyed. Uh, but Richard realized that on his way to Jerusalem, because he never gets that far, uh, he gets to Jaffa. In fact, that's the closest way he gets to Jaffa, which isn't that far from Jerusalem. But he realizes that, uh, you know, it wouldn't that, the, the Muslims would well defend Jerusalem, too well defended uh, for the Crusaders to have a chance at Jerusalem a second time. Uh, and a truce is made. 
And the truth is that the Muslims would, would take everything from Jaffa to Acre uh, and uh, the Crusaders would, and, and no, sorry, the Crusaders would have Jaffa to Acre. Muslims would have, take back Ascalon and the uh, Christians would be allowed to pray in Jerusalem, right? That was accepted. Uh, King Richard never wanted to come and pray in Jerusalem. I mean, maybe it's just arrogance, I don't know, but but then he, of course, he left. And Salah Hadin al Ayyubi, Rahimullah, therefore, has this a remarkable um, legacy. I mean, words can't fully describe uh, what he achieved in that situation, in that circumstance, in, in that time. Um, I think that, you know, when, also when he, therefore, Salah Hadin dies in 1193, uh, he always loved Damascus. He settles in Damascus. He goes back, to, he doesn't say Jerusalem, he goes back to Damascus. Uh, what happened, I'll just mention quickly about his death, that Salah Hadin al-Ayubi, uh, he has a fever, and it lasts for about 10 days, this fever. Uh, he has an amazing, amazing group around him of, of ulama, of people who are so loyal, Hadin ibn Shaddad, Al-Qadi al-Fadil, who was just amazing. Al -Qadil, by the way, Al-Qadi al-Fadil for the Third Crusade is the one that's bringing in all of these troops from these other places. And Salah Hadin says, I never won the war with the sword. I won the war with the, with the pen of Al-Qadi al-Fadl because he's amazing. Literature is writing all these poets and all, poems and all these letters and bringing in these troops, you know. Uh, and he says, I, I won the war with the, with the pen of Al-Qadi al-Fadl. And he's so loyal to him and he's, and he's by his side or bedside all the time. Ibn Shaddad al-Isfahani, Al-Qadi al-Fadl, Muhyiddin ibn al-Zaki was the... Uh, Imam at the Al-Aqsa, you know, when, when it was taken, he's there reciting Quran for him every day. He's hearing Hadith. Uh, Sahadin, I'll just to mention one thing I forgot to mention that, you know, in, uh, in, the, in the siege, I think it was siege of Acre, I think it was, there was a Christian woman whose child was taken from her, infant, like a four-month, five-month-old infant, a baby, and the child was taken from the Christian and and uh, and she's out and she's wailing and she's screaming in the streets, you know, and Salah uh, And then the, she appeals to her Christian princes who tell her, you should go and ask Salah because we know that he has justice in him. You know, they said about Salah they said, Ya, uh, ya Malik al-Adl, alladhi alzam al-Nas, sirat al-Khulafai qad fadahta al-Muluk bil-Adli, lama sirta fi nasi Sorry, Ya Ya Malik al-Adal, alad elzam al-Nasa, mhajat al-Bayda'i, qad fadahta al-Muluka bil-Adal, lama sirta fi nasi sirta al-Khulafai. He said, uh, oh, 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 the, the king of, of justice, you know, you're, you're bringing the clear white light, like the Prophet said, qad taraktum ala mhajat al-Bayda'i, layluha kanahariha, la yaziguhana ila halik. The Prophet said that, I've left you upon clear white ground, it's night, it's like it's day, and no one deviates from it except that he's destroyed. And he says that you know you're you're bringing this uh, clarity, and he says that you know you're you're bringing back like the like the narrative of the Khulafa Rashidin. I mean that's the standard you're making. Of course, people like him and Nuruddin Zengi before him, and so um, he said uh, he said uh, yeah. So the woman comes to Salahuddin and she's crying. Ibn Shaddad relates this in his book uh, Al Nawaz al Sultani. This is a biography of Salahuddin. And he says that she's crying and she says to Salah Hadin, so what's happened my child? Like, Salah Hadin takes money from him, from himself and gives it to the Muslims and says, go and bring this child back because the fair was the child's going to be sold on a black market. And so they take the money. And Ibn Shaddad says, I saw the woman crying and I saw Salah Hadin crying next to her. <laughs> Imagine. I saw the woman crying and I saw Salah Hadin crying crying next to him. this is an insan this is a human being <laughs> you know we're not animals <laughs> like you know we're not we're not beasts and animals we're human beings you know <laughs> and this is what he says and then when the child is brought back to the woman you know she grabs the child to himself and Salahuddin is crying and weeping you know and this is this Allah Akbar I mean this is the promises the Prophet says, beware of injustice because injustice is darknesses on the day of judgment. Salah Hadin was a human being. And, and even in his character, they said about him, uh, Kana, so he had 16 children, Salah Hadin, 16 children. 
And uh, once, uh, you know, and so he says that كان يجلس في أكثر أوقات فراغ كان يجلس عند أولاد الصغار لا لا يطلب لا لا يعلو على الناس ولا يطلب العلو. الصراحة دين had sixteen children, and most of his free time was spent sitting with his children, and he would never exalt himself in front of people, and nor would he seek exaltation. Right, human being. In the Khilaf of Umar ibn Khattab, there was once a, a, a governor right, who came in to Umar's uh, residence. And Umar was, it says, Kana, uh, um, was Sibyani yalabun ala batni. His, Umar's kids were playing on Umar's stomach, on his stomach. And the governor came in and it says, الفعل, He didn't like this action of Umar, right? Because he thought Umar should be like brawny and big and so kind of, you know, solid. Like, you know, what's a, what he doing with his playing with ch- children on the floor? And, uh, and so I didn't get, and so Umar gets up and he says to the man, he says, uh, he says, Kayfa anta fi ahlik. How are you with your family then? He thinks, like, how are you with your family? And, uh, and the man says, uh, ahad. If when I enter my house, no one speaks, right? When I enter my house, no one is allowed to speak. It's like everything is in lockdown. You know, no one's allowed to speak because the father's entered. And Umar says to him, uh, you're removed from your position. You know, you're removed. You're no longer governor. If you cannot show kindness in your family, how could you show kindness in the Ummah of Muhammad I mean, this is the standard, the standard he gave him, you know. And Salah Hadin was similar, was like this. This is his role. This is what he's copying, his role model. He's like that. And so he has this about him. And so that happened, in fact, it happened in Acre, this incident with this Christian woman, Salah uh, you know, when he's in, in his illness, but he gets, he gets, he he's ill, then he recovers, and then people are very happy, then he gets ill again, and he, he recovers, people are very happy. Uh, but there, there came a point where they realized that, you know, his, uh, although he was sweating, which was seen as a good sign, uh, he then is unable to eat. And these are all, all signs that, you know, his situation is really deteriorating. They bring in the Quran, it's like this. And no poets, by the way, were allowed now. No poets, no poetry, all that was finished now. Uh, no poets were allowed there to sing his praises, nothing. Uh, only the ones who were close to him were allowed, you know, uh, you know, in his uh, in his room to be with him in his final moments. And they say that, you know, on the day he died, that um, the Quran is reciting, and he's reciting from the verse where Allah in the Quran says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and when he came to this, uh, Salhadeen, this is a few days before he died, he said, uh, Salhadeen suddenly woke up and said, Sahih, he says, that's true. Uh, and then on the day he died, when he's reciting the verses in the Quran, it's, it's, I think the similar kind of verses uh, that he, uh, he then passes away uh, on the recitation of the Quran. And um, and they said that the the loss was so big it was like the loss of a prophet. I mean, he said people they mourned for him, like they would mourn for a prophet. Um, of course, nothing is comparable to the loss of any Nabi of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And Salah Hadin is is nowhere near that. Uh, but they said that the the sense of loss, bereavement, was so intense in the streets amongst people that they couldn't believe that somebody who had been with us for so long and who did so much. I mean. Just the sacrifice, you know, Salah Hadin, he he left nothing. Honestly, he left nothing. He only had one dinar and 40 dirhams in his estate. That's it. He didn't even have enough money to pay for his funeral. He didn't have enough money for the straw lining for his funeral. That al qadil father had to pay for that. He left behind no money, no estates, no shops, no nothing, right? Everything he gave as gifts to people or he gave as in the way of Allah, he just lived a life of frugality, but he lived a life of, of purpose, a life of vision in seeking Allah's favor, in seeking social transformation, in seeking you know, societal improvement, in seeking you know, uh, victory for the Ummah of Muhammad Sallam in defeating the Crusaders in his love for Beit al-Maqdis and Jerusalem. And so it's a... Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot to say, I think, for Salah Hadin. We've just touched on a few things that I, I, I pray, inshallah, were, were useful for us, inshallah. And um, may Allah make us of those who t- learn a lesson you know, from history 
and look at his character and see ways in which we can also emulate that character, that sense of purpose. You know, we have to, I think in our times today, there is so much that we're suffering from as an ummah. You know, it's interesting that there's a, a book called um, Time for Outrage by uh, Stefan Hassel, who was an Auschwitz survivor who died at the age of 91, 92, just a few years ago, writes this book before he dies as a kind of a, a plea to the human race to take on their shoulders important issues. In fact, his penultimate chapter is called uh, Outrage Over Palestine. He says the most, uh, you know, the most hurtful thing for him is what's happening to the Palestinians. But then he also has his final sentence in his book, which I, I took the courtesy of learning some time back. And I remembered it says that he says, we call for a mass public out uprising against the means of mass communication that offer nothing but mass uh, um, mass consumption uh, as a prospect for our youth, general amnesia and the outrageous competition of all against all. And he's saying that if we're all sucked in, seduced by these trappings of consumer culture, consumerism and dunya, uh, we will never have time to think about the suffering of any human being anywhere on earth. And I think that that's something that's very strong for us today. Uh, the second book I wrote, this one on being human, how Islam addresses othering, humanization, and empathy is now available for free download uh, on the web, on Sapiens Institute website, inshallah, for anybody who wants to seek access to it and read the book. Uh, it's a book that was launched in, in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, and uh, and I think it's, it's alhamdulillah, it's, it's a lot has been done with the book so far. Uh, but, but it's a book that in fact taps into a lot of these things that are current to our time today. Um, again, like I mentioned, it, it mentions it has sections on the Crusades as well, because that's when a lot of this othering uh, of Muslims really stems from uh, in, in, in Western European culture and also in, in French culture. And of course, we see what we're seeing today uh, with, uh, with the great insult that they're making against the character of the Prophet you know, in France. Um, and this is, again, this is just a, a reflection of it. Um, but we ask Allah for assistance and aid. May Allah keep your communities together. May Allah bless you all. And again, I'm very uh, honored that you invited me to say a few words about the great character of Salah al Ayyubi. Um, Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.